Good evening everyone, time for another member update. This is the weekly chart of gold on NetDania and what I've drawn in here is uh, the first thing I want you to notice is this sort of um, cone formation here which describes the bull market that we've had in gold so far. So the big question is going to be, is the bull market over? Well, I think you can see just based directionally on this trend line, it's not. Most people would say it's not. Um, some would say that it overreacted. You can see that it it tried to rush up to the line here. This, this line here is actually from the start point of the bull market. I picked it basically late 2002. And then it goes up to the very top, but you can see this line here in the first initial rise actually predicts the slope of this rise and it actually caught back up to it in the top in 2011. But you can see a series of attacks to try to get up to that uh, trend in the initial uh, breakout. But so that's the top rising trend line and then we have the lower rising trend line and then we have the lowest trend line you can see here uh, back to 900. Now the other important line that I've drawn in here is the 50% line and what I did was I just drew a line, you can't see it, it's off the chart, but it's down around 250 and then one at the top and you take the very middle of that and it's about 1080 roughly is the price that we get and that's this line right here. So you can see that there's two points that meet right here at that around that 1100 price. We're at that 1134 price right now with the weekly drop, the recent week, a big drop. And if we penetrate 1100 or 1080, then we've not only penetrated the upper trend line for the bull trend, but we've also penetrated the 50% retracement point. And, you know, these things are relative. I don't know how you define bull market and bear market. Some people define them in terms of uh, a time frame. So some people could look at this chart and see a bull market and then a bear market here and a bull market here and a bear market here. Uh, I tend to look at the larger time frame, but definitely this point here, this price point, the 50% point and the upper trend line is going to be a very important point because that a penetration of that is going to argue that a bear market started in 2011 for gold. Uh, now, I won't be completely convinced actually until I see the 900 price taken out because that's the original lower trend line for gold. The rest of these are basically accelerated trend lines where the trend just kind of went crazy and took off. So again, it's a relative thing. It's based on your definitions, but that 50% point, uh, upper trend line point, a breakdown through those would be fairly key technical change and possibly even by definition of a bear market. Now, silver is not quite the same. I don't have all the same lines drawn in for silver, but so much of the damage has already been done in silver, uh, and the trend is not nearly as sharp. Obviously, the cone, if we want to draw the, draw the cone on silver, then yes, it, it approximates the one on gold. You can see that. It's wider, though. So the cone is generally rising, but most of, uh, of that... Uh, cone has been completely corrected a huge percent and obviously we're way below that 50 percent line on silver so the rest of the time tonight i wanted to spend uh, we're going to start with a comment that was made this is my video that i just did a recent interview with uh reluctant preppers and i'm just responding to a comment here that was on the youtube comments and this is in response to a statement that I made about what's going on in China. And this is Grant Collier said, BJF loves him some China. And then my reply to that, of course, uh, AG Silver Bear, <laughs> Jennifer's called out here, extraordinary claims required, require extraordinary proof, comrade AG Silver Bear. She posted a couple of comments here defending me. And then I came back and, and defended myself. And this is what I said. 
But it's interesting, you see how she's called a communist? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's not a matter of what policies you believe in anymore. And anybody who knows this knows we're as anti-communist as you can possibly be and pro-free market. But those types of labels, they're political labels. They're not really economic labels, and they don't really deal with definitions. It's more name-calling. But this is my response. In the last 20 years, China has done a few things right and many things wrong. In the last 20 years, America has done everything wrong. Now, I'm going to try to show you with a comparison from Trading Economics site. And... What I've done here is I've pulled up the economic indicators from both the United States and China. And we're going to see here the there's going to be a lot of stuff that stands out. And so I'm just going to have to go down through them and comment on them one at a time. Now, I want you to keep in mind that some of the most important ones are not going to be the ones that we can compare pair because some of the most important ones are the ones that aren't there. For whatever reason, uh, just as an example I will give you, in the United States our labor force participation rate is roughly 62 percent. It's the lowest it's been in a long, long time. And labor force participation is defined as people who are in the job market, who are capable of being in the job market, uh, and who are actually working. So it's not the whole population, but it's uh, of, of those people who can work. So in the US, it's roughly 62%. It's been falling for quite some time throughout the entire Obama administration. Now, in China, at least on this trading economic site, you can't find this statistic. And of course, what I suspect is that China has a much better labor force participation rate. China has a much lower um, safety net, uh, much closer to no worky, no eaty over there. But uh, it's, a statistics that the, it's a statistic that's left out for whatever reason. But the actual number, I believe, is about 75%. And so given the relative populations, if you think about that, with China having um, 1.3 billion, 2 billion, whatever, like, uh, something like that, 350 million in the United States, just the difference in the labor force participation rate is something like 100, 150 million workers. That's our entire labor force. It's just a difference in the participation rate between the countries. But so let's look down at these and compare them. Now, a lot of these are based on GDP. And I'm going to show you here that not only is our GDP fake, because I really believe it is, the numbers are faked, but even what is admitted that makes up GDP is, is atrocious. We're going to see here in a minute. So... We start with the GDP growth rate and the unemployment rate. You can see uh, China's is, is lower, but we're going to look at one down below that shows that China is actually growing much faster than the U.S. Inflation rate is roughly the same. One of the big ones that just screams at you here is interest rate. Now, we're going to see down below what the interest rate for bank lending is. Now, in the... The interest rate for bank lending is actually very similar in both countries. But the interest rate for um, the official interest rate for on the government notes and uh, what you can actually earn is vastly different. So what that means is that in the United States, it still costs you a fairly decent interest rate to borrow any money. But if you lend money, you're not getting anything. Whereas in China, those two are very close. So just based on that one, the interest rate, uh, that's showing that China is much closer to having a real healthy economy as opposed to America, which is a very sick, fake economy because of the interest rates, they tell you that. Now, if you look at the balance of trade, you can see it's absolutely atrocious. Uh, United States is quoted as 42 uh, 42,601 in U.S. Uh, millions. And then China's balance in trade is 446 U.S. Uh, dollar, hundreds of millions. So China has a massive surplus, trade surplus, and we have a massive trade uh, deficit. 
Next one is government debt to GDP. You can see that the United States is over that 100% mark. That's a really, really key point. A lot of economists argue that once you pass that point, there is no return. That is beyond the point of no return. Whereas China is at a very low 43.9% government debt to GDP. The currency doesn't mean a lot. Uh, you can see here on the stock market, uh, if you just go by raw points, that doesn't mean a lot either because uh, those are just different indices. But you can see the U.S. is near an all-time high, whereas China really has that base between 2,000 to 3,000. Uh, their stock market has corrected. Uh, if we just pull out the tab here, you can see that uh, the, the correction in Chinese stocks has been significant and they're nowhere near, unfortunately I can't see, uh, let's do the daily, uh, they're nowhere near all-time highs the way the U.S. is. There's, there's a view of it. So you can see China is pretty much corrected. Most of the froth is already off of their stock market. So comparing stock markets, we would have to say that the U.S. is very overvalued, uh, whereas China, I would argue, is undervalued. The government bond 10-year uh, rate, you can get 3.42% uh, as opposed to the U.S., only 2.57%. Uh, GDP growth rate, um, I'm not going to look at that, but I'm going to look at the annual growth rate. Here's the one that gets reported the most here, and that's accurate because we know from the other numbers that China is rapidly gaining on the rest of the world on some of these, uh, the ones that are per capita. For example, GDP per capita, you can see 6,000 uh, in China, roughly one-ninth or one-eighth of what the U.S. is at 51,000 U.S. dollars. Uh, now, again, I already mentioned that these GDP numbers are cooked, and but based on this, you know, China's GDP per capita is much, much lower. Now, but that growth rate, it has relatively it has increased faster than any other uh, country in the world and it's still growing at that uh, seven percent clip whereas the u.s is a meager 1.6 and i don't even believe those numbers but let's get down to the gdp breakdown because this is a really important one and this is one of the first ones where we get that missing data here so you can see for the u.s we have gdp per capita and uh, per capita ppp we have GDP from agriculture, from construction, from manufacturing. In the U.S., we have GDP from mining, but we don't have it in China. We have GDP from public administration. We don't have that in China. We have GDP from services, and we have that in both, and transport. But utilities, we don't have GDP from utilities in China. Now, the first thing that jumps out at you when you look at these GDP breakdowns is you look at the U.S. categories. First of all, the category of public administration, that yes, that is what you think it is. That's GDP from the government. <laughs> and let me tell you, the, GD, the government doesn't produce any GDP. The government consumes GDP. So that's just a big old phony uh, joke right there that they would try to claim that we get uh, GDP from the government. But you can see how big that number is. That number, the GDP from public administration, is larger than the GDP from manufacturing uh, and much larger than from construction and agriculture and from mining. You can see that. Look at how tiny they are. 162 uh, for agriculture, um, 258 from mining, uh, so just tiny, 777 from construction. Uh, add all those together, and that's, that's going to be your traditional GDP, you know, you mine it, you grow it, uh, you build it, uh, agricultural construction, mi uh, manufacturing, mining, but look at the biggies here, services, 12,700, add that to public administration, we've got 15,000. So I think you can see from this how out of balance the U.S. economy is as far as a bunch of paper pushers and government workers, it's just absolutely insane. Now, let's look over at China. Uh, you can see these are in Chinese yuan, so we're just going to compare the numbers to each other. Agriculture at 40,000, construction 33,000, manufacturing 17,000, I'm sorry, 177,000. 
services 279,000 transport 24,000 so what jumps out at you here first of all there is no GDP from public administration so who's the communist um, but also uh, services is their largest category but you can see that GDP for manufacturing is right behind it at 177 whereas in the US it's just tiny uh, GDP from construction and agriculture we don't have mining um, but you add those together and it looks much more like a fairly balanced economy in China as opposed to the United States so let's keep going down and comparing these um, so another one that you want to look here you can see here government payrolls uh, that's one that's in the US doesn't exist in China interesting the ones again and again I saw when I was comparing these was that the ones I really wanted to know what they were so I could get you know kind of a peek between the cracks to see you know what's going on comparatively it was always that one was missing from one or the other so it makes it difficult to compare of course population here you can see the US is uh, at uh, less than a quarter of the population of China uh, one that jumps out at you that I had not noticed here is look at the retirement age the retirement age for women in China is 50 the retirement age for men is 60 we're going to see that down in their Social Security contributions but here it is 66 in the US now employment rate that's looking close to labor participation rate uh, you can see 59.7 again we don't have that we don't get that number out of China so continuing here um, not really going to go into the inflation because you know that those numbers I I don't trust them at all and they're not really any meaningful comparisons anyway so a real interesting one here is interest rate and interbank rate you can see it, this is what I talked about before what you can actually get the interest you can get when you loan money the type of thing that's causing the pension crisis that we have you can see uh, you have 4.35% uh, interest rate you can get on your money in China which is pretty decent especially if there actually is that 2% inflation rate if it's close to that that means there's a real yield in China of two and a half three percent something like that in the United States there's the negative yield uh, it's ridiculous there's no interest now look at the interbank rate you've got 0.99% in the US you've got 3.55 percent in China cash reserve ratio you've got 17 percent in China that's Chinese banks cash reserve ratio don't have a cash reserve ratio in the United States interesting uh, bank balance sheet I don't know how to compare that but uh, the numbers look fairly fuzzy when you compare them um, private debt to GDP you can see 197 percent in the United States but private debt to GDP is missing out of China balance of trade you can see that the horrific uh, 42,000 negative in the United States um, and then uh, a positive uh, China has much more exports the current account in the United States a ridiculous 112,000 million for the current account negative it's positive in China current account to GDP negative 2.7 percent positive 2.7 percent external debt a massive 8 million million in the United States uh, external debt uh, a positive they're owed money uh, terms of trade and tourism and terrorism and uh, business friendly index and stuff like that uh, those are political again so I'm not going to address those uh, government debt to GDP we already talked about that uh, government budget value government spending etc these are hard to compare because they're uh, in US dollars in the one hand and they're on Chinese yuan in the other it's roughly an 8 to 1 ratio so you can do the math on those nothing really stands out that much um, government spending to GDP well we don't have that I would love to have that I would love to know what the government spending to GDP is in China uh, I guarantee you it's 
ridiculously low compared to the United States. We have government spending and we have GDP, so I don't know why we can't get government spending to GDP, but we don't. Um, so here's the manufacturing. Uh, we're going to skip those mostly. Bankruptcies, that's just a raw number. And there's just a few more here that I wanted to point out. So uh, we do have uh, the vehicle sales here in both of these. And these are kind of interesting. So you can see in the United States, the total vehicle sales are 17.87 million vehicles are sold in the United States. Now, for vehicles that are actually manufactured in the United States, you've only got 3.75 million units. So we're only manufacturing less than a fifth of the cars we're driving. More than 80% of the cars that we drive in this country are imported. Now, if you look at China, you can see their car production is this uh, 2,638,000 and their sales are 2,938,000. So they're importing roughly 10% of their vehicles while we're importing roughly 80% of our vehicles. You can see on the car registrations, I'm assuming that's new car registrations per year. And you can see here in the US, uh, 567,000. I'm assuming that's more drivers because uh, otherwise that, those numbers wouldn't make any sense with uh, you know 18 million new cars each year and only 567,000. So I'm gonna assume that's new drivers. And uh, you can see here, the number in China is much, much higher, five times. Um, but there, there really aren't that many cars in China. There's uh, 18 million being sold in the U.S. Uh, with a population that's one-fifth of China, one-quarter of China, and yet China has got um, one-fifth or so of the vehicle sales. So is that a positive or negative? In my mind, that's a positive. That's a huge area for growth. For China and that I expect those numbers to rise you can see a hint at it with the car registrations being five times what they are in the US ease of doing business and corruption rank of course you can see China comes in with a horrible corruption rank and a horrible ease of doing business and the US has a great uh, ranking on the corruption index and uh, has a great ranking on the ease of doing business. And of course, the United States is becoming one of the worst places you can do business in the entire world. Uh, so other than that, uh, the only the last one I wanted to compare, you can see gasoline prices. Gasoline prices in the US are actually um, higher, or no, I'm sorry. They're just a little bit lower, but China here is at 65 cents uh, per liter. U.S. is at 57 cents per liter. Uh, so you can see that it's not that much more expensive in China to drive a car. And I've already mentioned um, all the cars that aren't allowed in the U.S. So I don't know what the statistic is on miles per gallon in China, but I would guess it's probably twice what it is in the U.S. because, uh, because of our environmentalist wackos we have in this country, but really because of corruption. Uh, we're not allowed to drive cheap cars, and we're not allowed to drive fuel-efficient cars. It's a massive conspiracy, but again, that's a whole other topic. The last one is household debt to GDP. You can see household debt to GDP in the U.S. is about 80%. In China, it's about 40%. So uh, we're twice as bad off in that category. So you can see when we add them all together, and the ones that we can compare, the United States looks really bad. The ones that we're not allowed to compare, we can suspect those are even worse. And that has to do with government spending. It has to do with people on the dole. It has to do with people uh, riding in the cart rather than pulling the cart. Uh, it has to do with who is going up and who is going down. I think the pr picture is pretty clear. Uh, I'm not saying that I am pro-China, but I am more pro what China is doing lately than I am pro what the U.S. is doing, which is... Uh, rapidly swirling the toilet bowl. And we'll talk to you next time.